Hi everyone, I'm Andrew Zali, Planet's Chief Impact Officer. You've heard a lot over the last few days at this conference about some of Planet's exciting new products, our new remote sensing capabilities and development, and what some of our terrific customers and partners are doing in areas like forestry and agriculture, scientific research, international peace and security, and ESG reporting. My gosh, there's just a ton going on. So in this, the last set of remarks at Explore 2021, I'm not here to make news or to show you a bunch of new use cases. Instead, I'd like to zoom out a bit and offer a few thoughts about the planetary challenges we face and how we might address them together. We are now in the early but practical stages of a once in a lifetime realignment of humanity and the planet. What was once a prophetic call from scientists and environmentalists is being transformed finally into a practical, enormous agenda for real, deep, and systemic change. It's an agenda if we can keep it. Meeting this agenda will involve all of us, and the stakes could not be higher. Consider that at this point in human civilization, we have now terraformed 75% of the landmass of the Earth. We're using a third of the world's land surface just for agriculture alone, for growing our crops and feeding our animals. We've significantly impacted 60% of the ocean's ecosystems, and some of the most important fisheries in the world are currently on a trajectory to be gone by the middle of the century. Speaking of the middle of the century, we've put up to a million species at risk of extinction by 2050, and we now have less than a decade to go before we lock in the worst effects of climate change. In fact, of the five most likely scenarios regarding the future of the climate, the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recently identified only one path that we can take to avoid locking in the worst effects. And that pathway requires that we act now. Now, all of these data points taken together are part of a larger story. The Swedish environmental scientist Johan Rockström and his colleagues at the Stockholm Resilience Center identified a set of nine planetary systems and their boundaries which sustain humanity and make it possible for all of us to flourish on the planet. Today, humanity has pushed at least four of the nine systems past their healthy boundaries, climate change, biodiversity, land system change, and the biogeochemical flows associated with nitrogen and phosphorus are all in the red, and other systems are inching ever closer. And this is all before we add another billion people to the planet in the next decade. We must act decisively and immediately if we want to return to what Rockstrom and his colleagues properly term a safe operating space for humanity. Inaction will amplify humanitarian crises, conflicts, and human rights abuses. And those least responsible, the poor and vulnerable, will bear the greatest impacts. Now, the good news is that governments and intergovernmental organizations, companies and NGOs, scientific bodies, and all kinds of other actors and activists and the public at large have, are all becoming aligned and all are moving toward action. Governments have signed up for the UN Sustainable Development Goals, a group of 17 objectives, including eliminating extreme poverty, eliminating extreme hunger, taking better care of our planet. It's an agenda for change unlike anything we've ever had before. The Paris Climate Agreement has aligned governments around the world toward a less than two degree future of climate change. And financial institutions and regulators are beginning to treat climate risk as investment risk. Companies, likewise, are responding in kind with plans to decarbonize. The signals are all there for a deep shift in what we value, what we measure, and what we reward. The Greek mathematician, physicist, engineer, astronomer, and inventor, Archimedes, once said, if you give me a lever and a place to stand, I can move the world. Well, now we have to move the world, and quickly. And the data, analytics, and other technologies planets and our partners produce can be a significant part of that lever. As daunting as these challenges are, it's important to remember that we've never had better tools to address them. Breakthroughs in energy and transportation and connectivity and countless other fields mean that, yes, we're living in an age of super problems. 
but also superpowers. We're simultaneously at risk of entering the sixth, sixth extinction, the sixth time in the history of life that biodiversity has collapsed, but we're also living through the second renaissance with an unprecedented explosion of knowledge and insight and capabilities. We've never faced bigger challenges nor had better tools to address them. The tools of remote sensing and AI particularly are going to be foundational to the sustainability transition. They make it possible for us to sense and make sense of the world around us as never before and enable real-time feedback loops that can show us how our actions impact the world both positively and negatively. And they will help us anticipate, navigate, and blunt the sharpest edges of disruption. In the decades ahead, we have to pull off an incredible hat trick. We have to simultaneously drive ourselves toward a low carbon and sustainable future and respond to the inevitable shocks and disruptions along the way. In other words, we're going to have to foster both sustainability and resilience. Let's start with the sustainability revolution. There are three ways in which Planet's data helps drive this forward. First, our data helps make the invisible visible, illuminating countless forms of social and ecological change in areas like biodiversity, deforestation, sustainable agriculture, illegal fishing, and all in real time. In doing so, we enable better understanding of these systems, more effective policy making, and increased accountability. Let me give you just one example. We worked with an organization called Salo AI and Vibrant Planet to build the California Forest Observatory. It uses satellite imagery and airborne LIDAR data to map every tree in California from space, right down to the individual tree level. It replaces much lower resolution data that's many years out of date. And this is what it looks like when you simulate over 200 million individual wildfires using the data I just showed you. It's the most current wildfire hazard data available for any place on Earth. Now imagine that you're underwriting insurance in this state, or running a beleaguered utility, or measuring the climate risks to a company based in California. This is the highest resolution tool for understanding those risks, bar none. And we're exploring many ways to expand this work with our friends at Salo. Here's another example you'll hear more about at next month's COP26 meeting. That's the big UN climate summit that's happening in Glasgow, Scotland. The Climate Trace Coalition, that's a group of technical NGOs and related organizations backed by Al Gore, are using artificial intelligence to extract climate emissions data from our satellite imagery. They use the same tools that Google uses to tell you whether a picture is of a cat or a dog to monitor energy plants and factories, other sources of emissions to estimate their carbon emissions with precision. This is data that's not available and insights that are not available in any other way. And they will play a crucial role in helping company, countries and companies and institutions measure their progress on their climate ambitions and hold them account when they fall short. Now, having made the invisible visible, we then work with organizations to help them take more effective and sustainable action. For example, by using our data to target exactly when and where to apply water, and fertilizer, insecticide, precision agriculture companies help farmers use less of each. By using information as a substitute for ecologically inefficient action, we drive down the negative environmental impacts of those activities. Every gallon of fertilizer that does not need to be manufactured and transported, applied to crops, only then to leach into the soil of our rivers provides a double benefit, both to the farmer's bottom line and to the world we all live in. Finally, as you've heard, our data can serve as a key ingredient for next generation ESG indicators, helping investors and markets and regulators better measure things like climate and biodiversity risk and link them to investment risk. You know, ever since Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, capitalism has produced unrivaled wealth, but it's been incomplete in part because it's treated nature as something external to capital markets, something essentially limitless and self-replenishing and free. Too cheap to meter, nature went unmeasured and undervalued. And you can see the lasting impact of that idea in the world around you today. Consider Amazon. This is one of the world's most valuable companies. Its value is actually computed billions of times a day. 
Compare it to the actual Amazon for which the company is named, whose value is only measured when the trees are cut down and turned into timber, cleared for agriculture or for pasturing animals. But of course, those forests, are, old growth forests, are not something just valueless, some raw material or natural resource that has no value and, until we begin to use it. It's the home to countless indigenous peoples and living creatures, and it's the living machinery that not only stores the carbon we emit, but also helps us breathe on this planet. Not to mention, the Amazon is indescribably beautiful and worth saving for that reason alone. By measuring the treasure, as my friend Andy Karsner likes to say, we can begin to bring these externalities into our economic thinking, help financial markets better incorporate their value, assess the environmental, and climatological, social, and governance risks, and factor these impacts for companies and markets. That's why we're so excited about our partnership with Moody's. It promises to use space to put sustainability more squarely on the balance sheet. In all of these cases, our data acts as an independent source of insights and a key ingredient in trusted indicators of sustainable and unsustainable practices. Unfortunately, we're already living in a changed world, a world of intensifying disruptions and inevitable surprises. Even as we move toward a more sustainable future, there will be shocks and disruptions along the way. And here too, our data can help build new powerful forms of resilience. Now, all resilient systems, from the cells in your body to an organization to the complex dynamics of an ecosystem, engage in a series of activities, what we might call kind of like the verbs of resilience. They are bucketed together, these activities. The first is what we call building regenerative capacity. These are the longer term, slower processes that keep a healthy system healthy. We know, for instance, that conserving intact ecosystems like coral reefs and forests and giving them a space and time to regenerate plays a huge role and will play a huge role in building a more sustainable future. And we know that planets' monitoring capabilities help deter deforestation, illegal fishing, exactly what we need to de-intensify impacts on ecosystems and keep those that are healthy healthy. Now, the next verb of a resilient system is listening for change, listening and instrumenting a system to listen for the signals of disruption. This is a continuous and much more fast-moving process than building regenerative capacity. It's a continuous activity. Now, not every disruption can be heard ahead of time, but the very act of instrumenting a system for listening is a form of capacity. And here, the velocity of information is an absolute game changer. Through continuous observation, we shift from reactive to real-time and from real-time to predictive modes of thinking and acting. In humanitarian circles, for instance, with better and faster information, we're seeing the rise of what's called anticipatory action. Systems that sense an impending disaster and release aid before it strikes, helping people get out of the way of danger rather than just cleaning up afterwards often with vastly less suffering and at a fraction of the cost. These ideas, like anticipatory action, have been around for a decade or longer, but now better data is finally making it a practical reality. Now, the next stop in a resilient system is responding to disruptions when they occur. This is also a rapid activity, although it's one that's often hampered by a lack of situational awareness. Because we're imaging the whole earth, earth every day, planet sees the state of affairs just before every disaster strikes, which turns out to be just as important as seeing the damage that's been done. Our data has been used in countless disaster circumstances, from oil spills in Mauritius to hurricanes in the Gulf to responding to the terrible explosion that happened last year in Beirut. And finally, there's the last bucket of a resilient system, and that's learning and transformation. When a system has shown itself to be vulnerable to disruption, do we strengthen it? Do we abandon it? Do we replace it with something else? This again is a slow process, learning and change, the deep structural change. It takes time and our data can help inform the process. Now the important thing to see is that all of these activities are happening in every complex system all the time. Resilience actually emerges at the interplay between these four processes, from a slower outer loop of building healthy capacity and undergoing learning and transformation, and a faster inner loop of listening and responding to change. Data binds all of these parts together. 
The better the data, the more resilient the system. It's like the Chilean philosopher and biologist Francisco Varela said, when a living system is suffering from ill health, the remedy is typically found in connecting that system more with itself. Data is the connective tissue that drives contemporary resilient systems, and it is an important companion to the sustainability narrative that we're developing. Now, the last thing I'd like to talk to you about today before we close is about just thinking about data, thinking with data. What, is it, what does it mean? Well, some people like to say data is the new oil, and I personally think this is the wrong or at least a terribly limited metaphor. It might be better to say that data is the new fertilizer. In fact, it makes a lot of good things grow in its soil, new approaches, new value propositions, and the like. Data is also many other things, and it's worth pausing to reflect on them. Data is the glue for collaborations. It creates a common operating picture that allows many actors to work together from the same source of truth. Data is also a source of organizational change. In this period of significant change, change favors the swift. Data and AI organizations are more insightful, lighter weight, and more nimble, and they're far more likely to persist, recover, and thrive amid all this disruption. Data is also unrefined social power. We live in an unequal world, and we have to be careful that in distributing data, we don't just disproportionately empower the already powerful. Planet has dr already dramatically lowered the cost and the barriers to access for space imagery for countless organizations who would never have otherwise had access. And in that sense, we have lowered barriers, but many remain. That's why, in addition to our traditional commercial business, we have a strong focus on building what we call digital public goods. These are science-grade digital assets that are built on our data and accessible to all at no cost, especially to those who live and work closest to the problems. Building digital goods requires us to bring many actors to the table, governments and science, philanthropy and technologists, civil society groups. But when we all come together, we can accomplish something that none of us alone can do. Our huge program with the uh, NICFI and the Norwegian government uh, focused on deforestation and the Allen Coral Atlas, which recently completed its mission to map all of the world's coral reefs, are great examples of such public goods. And now we're partnering with colleagues at Neotero to explore ways to take our data and tools and make their resources available to indigenous peoples who act as guardians for some of the world's most vital ecosystems. Now, strange as it might seem to hear, data is also a tool for something else that's more personal and candidly a little more intimate. Every tool of scientific discovery from the microscope to the gene sequencer eventually becomes a tool for moral discovery, for a change within. Because in understanding the world, in making the world legible to us, they help us see ourselves in a new context. This is one of the reasons we work closely with artists at Planet. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about the technology here at Explore, but in fact, we work with extraordinary artists every year who we provide a special residency where we provide them access to tools and resources to make work about our planetary home. These artists help, our, help us see our own work and, and the world anew. Let me give you just one example. This is a recent piece of work from a fiber artist named Yunnan Ma, one of our 2021 artists in residence. She took the first light image from one of our Dove satellites, our very first, and explored how the place that was captured in that early image changed over time through these beautiful textile interpretations. She captured the light and color, some of the dynamics of place in a way that brought it to life in a way that we never could have thought. And in this broader sense, I think what these tools do is give us a kind of moral mirror for humanity, and a, a, a way of understanding and inspecting the world that imbues us with a sense of the planetary, how the world is changing, how big it is, how fragile it is, how beautiful it is, how dependent we are on it and how interconnected we are with everyone else who is living on it at this time, humans and non-humans alike. It's humbling. And in that humility are the seeds of a change of perspective about the world and our place in it and our obligations to it. And that leads me to my last point. And that is that if it's shared widely, our data is a tool for collective safety. 
Scientists have long asked why certain species, birds and fish and humans among them, flock together. After all, doesn't having all, uh, everyone kind of mill around in the same place increase the risk of predators? You know, if you're a fish, if you're, a, if you're an insect, you could be swooped in on. And the answer turns out that the reason we do this is found in what's called the many eyes hypothesis. It's the simple idea that as members of social species flock together and have many overlapping perspectives on the world, on the same world, they collectively form greater safety. If we're gonna get through this trend, great transition ahead, we will need as many eyes and hands and minds and hearts as possible trained on our changing world and ready to use every tool at our disposal to rebalance our relationship with it. This is the largest technological challenge of our times, it's the largest market opportunity of our times, and it's the largest moral challenge of our times, all in one. We are excited to work with you, our partners and customers and fellow travelers, to help us squeeze all the value we can from these new capabilities in this time of critical planetary emergencies and help us discover all the things that these tools are good for and all the good we can do with them together. Our journey is just getting started and we're delighted to be on it with you. Thank you. <laughs>